Hello, I'm Hannah Donnert with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Chainjoy is bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls, webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's CHE EDC Strategies Partnership Webinar, which is titled Endocrine Disrupting Chemicals and COVID-19. Our moderator today is Jerry Heindel, founder and director of Commonweal's Healthy Environment and Endocrine Disruptor Strategies. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief, brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature at the top of the menu, on the menu bar on your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentation, our moderator will read out questions for our speakers to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period, and we'll follow up on unanswered questions after the webinar. For those who have called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. The webinar is scheduled to last for 60 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Jerry. Okay, thanks, Hannah. I'm very pleased to lead this important webinar today. I'm going to start by introducing our three outstanding speakers. I'm going to give very short bios so we can have more time for their presentations and your questions. So our first speaker is Linda Birnbaum, PhD. Linda recently retired as the director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the National Toxicology Program. And she's currently scientist emeritus at NIEHS. She is the author of more than 800 peer-reviewed publications, book chapters, and reports, and I suspect she's given more than 1,000 invited presentations on some aspect of environmental health. She's a board-certified toxicologist and certainly one of the most knowledgeable and respected scientists in the public health and endocrine disruptor field. Our second speaker, is Ailey Cohen, MD. Ailey is a board certified rheumatologist and integrative medicine specialist and founder of Integrative Rheumatology Associates. She's on the faculty of the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine, where she created and oversees the environmental health curricula for the program. In 2017, she co edited the textbook integrative environmental medicine along with Fred Bomsal and they now have a new book called Non-Toxic Guide to Living Healthy in a Chemical World that will be released later this year. So our third speaker is John Peterson usually called Pete Myers PhD. So Pete's the founder and chief scientist of Environmental Health Sciences, which is a nonprofit organization that promotes public understanding of advances in scientific research, focusing on links between the environment, climate health, and human health. This organization publishes Environmental Health News, which sends out a daily compilation of important environmental health news called Above the Fold. And I hope everyone on this webinar gets this important daily newsletter. He co-authored the highly acclaimed book, Our Stolen Future with Diane Dumanaski and Theo Coburn. He's an adjunct professor of chemistry at Carnegie Mellon University. Pete works tirelessly behind the scenes to improve the impact of endocrine disruptor research on human health. So with that, Linda, I'll turn the program over to you. Well, thank you very much, Jerry. I hope my slides are up for everyone to see. Yes. Okay, great. So what I'd like to do is do a very brief trip um, through the issues of endocrine disruptors using a couple of key ones as examples. I'm gonna talk about how they relate to specific chronic diseases, which are in fact, risk factors for COVID. And I just wanted to remind everyone 
that we have a tremendous increase in chronic non-communicable diseases. So while we are living through a very difficult infectious pandemic, we also have a pandemic when it comes to the chronic non-communicable diseases. And in fact, throughout the world, even in our um, less developed countries, the diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, obesity, asthma, autism, cancer, are all the major causes of morbidity and mortality throughout the world. Now, when we talk about the COVID pandemic that we are all living through, or hopefully we're all continuing to live through it, this was just um, a snap I took from the Washington Post just over a week ago, at which point there were about a hundred, over 110 million 110,000 deaths in the US. In fact, that number is well over 115,000 now, and there are over 2 million reported cases. And what you can see is the hotspots for where the pandemic has occurred, but this is rapidly changing as we know that we appear to be having great increases in, in the uh, viral infections in many different parts of the country, which before had been barely um, touched. We do understand that there are factors that increase our susceptibility to um, uh, the, the virus. And the one that we have absolutely no control of is our age. We are whatever we are. <laughs> and and uh, for those of us who are now considered elderly, uh, that is obviously a concern. Part of it is obviously because there are many systems in our body, like our kidneys and our lungs, that decline and function about 1% a year after the age of 25. We know that chronic lung conditions such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and asthma increase risk. We know that, for example, um, different kinds of heart disease can be problematic, especially high blood pressure. We know that obesity puts people more at risk, likely because it's an inflammatory condition, which means that your immune system is already highly activated. We know that diabetes, both type one and type two, are increased risk factors. And we know that people who are immunocompromised, and whether it's because they are being treated, for example, with chemotherapy, or because they have some kind of health condition which results in a lower, um, lower competence of their immune system, and this is probably part of the reason that older people are more susceptible are at increased risk. <clears throat> so I, I mentioned that the world has more chronic noncommunicable diseases, but this is especially true in our country, where we have um, of our over 300 million people, over 30% are actually obese, um, and um, over another 30% are, are overweight. We have over 34 million people who have type 2 diabetes, and I should mention that not only is that rapidly increasing, but so is type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease. And we have almost 24 million people have different autoimmune disorders, we have at least 25 million people who have asthma, and this um, is from children all through the ages of, of the elderly. And I find it kind of discouraging that for a country as wealthy as we are, we are number 43 for, uh, of the world's countries for deaths due to lung disease, and we are number two or three for deaths due to high blood pressure or heart attacks. So the big picture is um, our environment, which is in fact responsible for nearly 25% of all the deaths. And this is really an underestimate since everything um, in our health is determined not only by our genes, but also by our environment. And our environment includes anything that is really external or even internal to us. So our infectious agents like the vaccine, the virus that causes COVID is part of our environment, as are things like prescription drugs. It's not only agricultural chemicals and, um, for example, synthetic materials and personal care products. Also things, for example, like stress. So what about, what's our endocrine system? I think what is important to understand is that our hormone system is incredi incredibly complex. It has many different control points and many parts of it interact. And many, um, it's highly regulated so that our responses can be very finely tuned and sensitive to different um, perturbations. 
a very important thing is that we don't need a lot of chemicals or endocrines, our, our hormones um, around. They operate at extremely low doses. And what we need to realize is the effects can be, it can be activational, especially in adults, or organizational when we're dealing with development. And while our endocrine system can be perturbed and then recover in, in adults, during development, if you throw a monkey wrench in the process, it's unlikely to be able to be reversed. Our hormone systems are also involved in a multitude of our chronic diseases. And endocrine disrupting chemicals are defined as any exogenous substance or mixture that alters the function of our endocrine system and consequently causes adverse health effects in an intact organism or its progeny or subpopulations if you're dealing with ecological impacts. And the World Health Organization declared in 2012 that they have become a global threat. So exposures to endocrine disruptors are ubiquitous. They're all around us. I mentioned agricultural chemicals, and these are things like pesticides and herbicides and fungicides, but also things that are involved in food additives and packaging, such as plastics. We have lots of industrial chemicals and their byproducts. Think about air pollution and different kinds of solvents that you use and things like PCBs. We have waste products, things that um, we don't intentionally make, but they're produced from, for example, from combustion and other processes. Um, we have many different kinds of drugs and we have chemicals that come to us from plants that are naturally occurring. They're not synthetic, but in fact, they can disrupt our endocrine system. And then lest you think, or I would urge you to remember that many of the, the makeup that you use, all kinds of personal care products, things that are in many of our consumer products that theoretically are there to make us safer, such as flame retardants and different kinds of coatings are also endocrine disruptors. Some of these bioaccumulate and some of, the, some of these are extremely persistent. So now I'm gonna switch and talk about a couple of kind of prototypical endocrine disruptors that I think are in the news now. And first I'm gonna mention the PFAS, which are the per and the polyfluoroalkylated substances. These are everywhere. There are over 5,000 of them. Essentially every one of us carries these, some of these in our bodies. Um, they are extremely stable and persistent in the environment. There's essentially nothing in the environment that can break them down. They're present in water, air, and soil, and they are everywhere in the world, including, for example, polar bears. Um, I've listed some of the compounds that have been routinely measured in wildlife as well as in people, but we're just beginning to develop a means to look agnostically. And in fact, then we find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds in our body and in our environment. As I said, they're very persistent. They have very long half-lives in people. For example, uh, some of the most common have half-lives in the neighborhood of two to five years. Although some of the newer ones, which are, have short half-lives like the PFBS, that only is a half-life in people of two to three weeks, but it never leaves the environment. Extremely stable in the environment. And the more that we study them, the more that we find out that these have a plethora of health effects um, have been observed not only in animal studies, but in epidemiology studies. So we know that these can impact our thyroid, our kidneys, our reproductive all, um, organs. They can cause cancer. They are associated with an increased risk of developmental neurotoxicity. They impact our liver. They impact our pancreas. Um, and I could go on. So one of the uh, COVID associated effects of immune suppression, I just wanted to show you this slide that there, the National Toxicology Program released a systematic review four years ago where they reviewed all the experimental data and all the epidemiological data. And the conclusion was that um, the PFAS chemicals, this was specifically PFOA and PFOS, are presumed human immunosuppressants. There's also evidence for hypersensitivity and autoimmunity associations there as well. If you look at the curves, which um, you can see on your screen in the right, what you can see is that the PFAS, and this is early life exposure, in utero and infantile exposure to these chemicals, 
results in a reduced ability to mount an effective um, immunization response to, to, vac to vaccines. And people may say, well, what does it mean if you can't, don't get as, men, as many antibodies as you want? Well, the answer is, at least in the children, there are now, these are studies that are coming out of the Faroe Islands, but there are similar studies coming out of cohorts in Norway and in Japan and some in the US showing that this is a general response which is associated with increased incidence of infections and hospitalizations among children. So another class of chemicals that I think we should think about are the phthalates. And the phthalates are pretty much everywhere. They are uh, no longer in rubber ducky, but they're certainly in your makeup, they're in your nail polish, they're in many plastic products, and they're really very present in packaging. Um, of foods and toys as well. Uh, a lot of our exposure to these is coming from our diet because they're used for food packaging. And then also house dust appears to be a very major source. And phthalates um, are a, um, again, a pretty much ubiquitous exposure. And so phthalate, phthalates are associated with uh, many, many um, studies. Again, we have experimental studies in a variety of animals, but we also have data coming from our epidemiological, our human observational studies, and we do see the phthalates. We know they're endocrine um, active compounds. They, in fact, can interfere with androgen action and have reproductive outcomes. They also interfere during fetal development. More and more studies are showing that there's an increased uh, risk with neurodevelopment, and you can see that um, on the on the, the factor on the screen, I'm sorry, on, on the graph in the left of, of your, the three graphs, which is showing an increased um, risk of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder associated with mom's phthalate exposure. We're finding, if you look at the bottom, that's showing how phthalate is associated with problems with sperm motility. And these kinds of studies have been repeated many times. And then in the top one on your right is showing the link between mom's exposure to phthalates and an increase in the child's um, uh, BMI, which is one measure and indicative of obesity. There are also studies that show an increased risk of insulin resistance and diabetes. There are studies showing um, links to cancer. And again, thinking of our COVID, some impacts on the immune system, especially related to asthma and high blood pressure. And the third endocrine disruptor I was going to use as a prototype is BPA, bisphenol A. And I should mention bisphenol A is but one of a family of unfortunate substitutes which are now being used um, since BPA was replaced in baby bottles and sippy cups uh, um, almost 10 years ago. But BPA disrupts not only our estrogenic system, but many other endocrine systems. And it's been associated with an increase in obesity and diabetes. Again, risk factors for COVID-19 associated with impacts um, um, on the brain, uh, increased risk of cancer, reproductive abnormalities, and again, heart disease, a risk factor for COVID-19. So this is just, uh, the two panels are showing you the issues with obesity that have, are occurring in our country and around the world. If you look at the one on the right first, the United States is about fifth one down, so we, our people are not as heavy, our children are not quite as heavy as in Greece, but we certainly have um, five to 17 year old children, for example, about 30% of them are um, obese, which is a tremendous change from say 30 and 40 years ago. If you look at the graphs of our country on the left-hand side, what you can see is the increase in obesity occurring over the 25-year uh, period from 1985 to 2010. And even places like Colorado, which prided themselves that they did not have an increased risk of obesity, have now joined the rest of our country as well. So BPA um, impacts many pathways that are related to obesity. We can see that BPA is associated, for example, with increased production of glucose in the liver and a decrease in insulin receptors. It impacts our pancreas so that insulin production can be um, affected. Insulin talks to our muscles and they have let more trouble with BPA in dealing with um, glucose and with insulin. And in fact, BPA impacts our adipose tissue, 
leading to an increase in some of the hormones such as leptin, which are associated with fatty acid accumulation. As well, there are changes in our brains, especially in the hypothalamus that are associated with BPA exposure. Now I'm gonna talk about air pollution and air pollution is a very complex mixture. There are certainly endocrine disruptors in um, air pollution as well as, for example, uh, things like um, ozone and nitrous oxides. But air pollution is associated with a whole raft of different adverse health effects. And some of these, again, are related to risk factors for autism. So coughing and wheezing and asthma, bronchitis and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma, increase in blood pressure, increase in atherosclerosis and in heart attack and ischemic heart disease, um, as well as increases in cancer as well, are all associated with susceptibility to the, um, to the virus. So I was just gonna focus here on the association between ambient air pollution and diabetes. And we know that air pollution is associated with changes, for example, in different kinds of, if you look at the, the figure on the left, it's impacting both um, uh, our macrophages and our Th1 and 2 cells, which are involved in our immune system. It increases uh, lipolysis and lipogenesis, for example, in the adipose tissue. It directly impacts the liver and the muscle and the brain. I think many of us think of air pollution as only impacting our lungs, but in fact, it is a systematic or systemic um, exposure. And overall, it leads to an increase in glucose and an increase in fatty acids and an increase in um, insulin resistance. And again, people who are especially susceptible to COVID include people with obes obesity and metabolic dysfunction. And asthma is another risk factor for, for uh, people becoming sick with COVID-19. And in this case, if you live close to a major road where the levels of air pollution are higher, there's an increased incidence of persistence of asthma. This, doesn't, this occurs not only if you're exposed in utero or early in life, but also if you are exposed as an adult, this can come about. And the graph on your right shows that this exposure and, and early onset asthma is especially true in children if they're girls and boys, um, this is not seen. And I would like to just remind everyone that frequently in our endocrine system, boys and girls, males and females respond differently, which is an important point. Given that we are suffering the health effects associated with major changes in our climate, I just wanted to rem remind people that we've had a tremendous increase in wildfires and we expect a very difficult wildfire season this summer. And some of the health effects that we get with wildfires are similar to what we get with heavy air pollution. We have things like acute respiratory problems, headaches, we have more asthma, we have irritation. And again, our chronic respiratory and cardiovascular systems um, are there as well. So I just wanted to point out again, the risks for COVID and pre-existing conditions. Uh, as I said, we can't do anything about our age. We are what we are, although many of us try to um, keep ourselves as healthy as possible. Um, and I think that I didn't really talk about the problems the association between endocrine compounds and liver disease and chronic kidney disease, but there are those associations. But I tried to give you some examples of toxic chemicals exposures, which are endocrine disruptors, which are present in our environment, associated or that, are, that have caused things like chronic lung disease, immunocompromised states, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and neurological disorders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Birnbaum. While everyone is waiting um, for us to have Dr. Cohen pull up her slides, I'd remind everyone in our audience, you can start putting in your questions now in the Q&A feature located at the top of your menu bar on Zoom. So feel free to go ahead and start asking questions. And at the end of the webinar, after Dr. Myers has finished speaking, our third speaker, um, we'll go ahead and start with the Q&A. And Ali, it looks like you're ready to go, or Ailey. Thank you. Ailey, are you in, are you on mute? Here we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great, okay. So um, thank you, Dr. Birnbaum. That was a wonderful presentation and actually really a perfect jumping off 
um, spot for where I'm going to try to take this talk. Um, so I'm going to get right into it. I have 15 to 20 minutes and it's just a lot of material. So I'm going to kind of cruise and rock and roll as fast as I can and, and make uh, and, and try to make this work. Um, so I want to start with um, the fact that clinically as a physician, um, uh, COVID-19 is a moving target. So every day uh, I'm getting emails from the clinical um, professionals, medicine uh, physicians, to, um, really kind of telling me what the new changes are, uh, where, what people are looking at, different avenues of research, um, ICU doctors, uh, people on the front lines. So it is a moving target. Um, but let me start with what we know about coronavirus. So we know it's an RNA molecule. You saw a picture of it on, on Dr. Birnbaum's last slide. It has lots of spikes on it, looks pretty ugly. Um, but RNA viruses, this particular one, uh, as well as many others, cannot live without a host. It needs a living, breathing host in order for it to survive. Um, COVID-19 or coronavirus um, can infect anyone. We know that it's possible of, of infecting any human being, whether you're young or old, rich or poor, sick or healthy, um, Republican or Democrat. We know that it's an indiscriminate infector um, to the human population. But what we're all trying to figure out, um, what we're all scrambling to figure out, is who's going to fare worse once they are infected. In other words, what are the characteristics of infected person that may actually make them move on to having symptoms, uh, maybe needing supportive care, um, hospitalization, oxygenation, ventilation, and even uh, uh, advance to death. Um, and that's the real trick is to figure out who these people are, what are their characteristics, and how can we intervene? So I want to start by showing just some Italian information, some of the data from Italy, since they were hit first, among others. Um, in this slide, we see the not only looking back observationally, which is how we're doing this in, in terms of trying to figure out how to move forward, um, not only is having one comorbid condition um, increase your risk for death, but the more comorbidities uh, that someone may have makes them likelier to die from coronavirus. Well, is this the same in the US population? Uh, well, this slide is looking at hospitalizations, not death. Um, this looked at um, 99 counties in 14 states um, over the course of uh, 30 days in March. And what they showed was basically, of course, as over 65, you can see there's a higher um, increased uh, rate of hospitalization. Um, but what's interesting, even in the middle zone here, there's certainly high rates of all of the chronic comorbidities uh, that Dr. Birnbaum discussed, but also you see here from the 18 to 49 year old range that obesity really stands out as one of the big issues in terms of uh, risk for hospitalization. Um, I think we can also um, discuss some of the other observations um, uh, in terms of hospitalization. We know that um, men more than women end up hospitalized um, and so much so that 75% of hospitalized patients are men in um, in Italy, uh, it was 82%. Um, so we need to think about why is it that men are, are having worse outcomes. We also know that the African American population and minorities um, are progressing to more severe disease. We don't have time here, unfortunately, to talk about some of the really important health disparities, um, environmental injustices that go along with minority communities. Um, but I'm hoping one, one day soon we'll be able to have that presentation. Um, we know that kids are not immune. We know kids are, you know, in the beginning, we were all very relieved to hear that kids were pretty much immune, but that's not entirely the case. Although rare and a small portion of our populations worldwide, um, some kids um, can go on to be quite ill um, and develop something called pediatric multi-system inflam inflam inflammation syndrome, also called PMIS. Um, and fortunately, um, it's being uh, really taken seriously, and I think that there's very good therapies for this. But again, it shows you uh, we don't know exactly which kids are going to progress to this severe type of inflammatory response. Other types of questionable um, uh, uh, increased risk um, in terms of predisposition of patients, perhaps hypercoagulable state, people with, you know, kind of sticky blood syndromes. Um, because we now see higher rates of uh, stroke and myocardial infarction um, in even younger patients. And literally just this morning, speaking of uh, moving target with COVID-19, I just got an email regarding a study that just was printed um, through New England Journal of Medicine uh, about possible ABO blood types um, potentially 
um, having some type of information regarding who might advance to more severe reaction uh, to COVID-19. Again, everyone can get it. It's the question of who's going to um, uh, progress to more serious clinical symptoms. So now I want to shift gears and I want to go from that big picture I was talking to to now um, how endocrine disrupting chemicals cause inflammation at the cellular level. And so this is a macrophage. Um, I want to start by saying that the human endocrine system and the human immune system are intricately uh, connected. There is tremendous crosstalk between these systems. They're not separate. They actually are very, um, these both systems are pivotal in their communication in promoting metabolic health throughout our lifetime. Um, exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals can alter the immune system, um, either by suppression, where it reduces its ability to fight, for instance, and you can have increased risk for uh, acquiring an infection, but can also stimulate uh, the immune system to be over-inflamed or hyperinflammation, And we see this type of thing with allergies, allergy season, autoimmune diseases, where um, the body's immune system is overactive, but actually directing its uh, wrath towards the human body, towards itself. So it's self-directed, um, depending on which disease that might be, which depends on which organ may be affected. For instance, rheumatoid arthritis, joints, generally speaking, um, lupus, Hashimoto's, those type of autoimmune diseases. So in this slide, I wanted just to point out a few things. Clearly, there's not enough time to go through all of this, but um, this is a macrophage. This is a type of cell um, that's uh, part of the innate immune system. We have the innate and we have the adaptive immune system. Uh, the innate immune system is the most primitive anthropologically. We've developed this very early on. And what's interesting about the innate immune system is that it really is not specific. It, it actually fights anything that comes its way. It doesn't know one, one person, one thing, one antigen from the next. Um, and so the adaptive uh, immune response actually does that um, where it's much more specific. So the macrophage here, you can see this is part of the innate immune system. You can see um, shows signaling of several inflammatory pathways as you can see um, here. Um, and of course here that lead to insulin resistance. Um, and that's quite important. In one pathway, if you look closely, you can see this inflammasome, if I get my marker here. This is an inflammasome, and for people who don't know what that is, it's a complex uh, made up of proteins that actually acts as a surveillance system in the cytoplasm. So if you remember back to biology class, um, the cell has cytoplasm and then it has a bunch of organelles. Um, and so inflammasomes are quite important, especially when it comes to COVID-19, which I'll talk about in a second, but really it's a surveillance mechanism. And so EDCs are able to set off a cellular inflammatory pathway in this flammasome, um, which if I can get my marker, oops, let me go up, um, where you have this inflammasome um, uh, increasing caspase-1, which increases cytokine release, particularly pro-inflammatory, um, cytokines IL-1 beta and IL-18. Um, so essentially endocrine disrupting chemicals can throw off this balance, this really very important balance between pro-inflammatory um, and anti-inflammatory immune response leading to cytokine release. Um, and overall this determines the magnitude of overall inflammation due to this imbalance. Now, if we took this inflammasome picture and we magnified it. So again, I wanna show this is the inflammasome here and we're just gonna zoom out and magnify this. Um, we can see that uh, upregulation of the inflammasome, particularly this NLRP3 portion of the inflammasome, um, all of this is, in fact, is affected by changes in the cytoplasm and also the organelles. You can have lysosomal rupture, lysosome is a structure, mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, leading to what's called ROS, or reactive oxygenated species. Uh, the endoplasmic uh, reticulum, which is part of the, the cell, um, has stressors that can be affected by endocrine disruption, again, leading to this inflammasome response. And in turn, the inflammasome response is in increasing cytokine expression. The reason the NLRP3 uh, component of this is actually really important to remember is because as I move forward, there are several um, or I should say many um, lifestyle changes, lifestyle effects that actually decrease the inflammasome, specifically the NLRP3 inflammasome response. So here you have uh, later on, I'm gonna talk about lifestyle directly infecting the uh, affecting the inflammatory response, particularly to endocrine disruption. 
So I don't want to labor too long on this slide. Fortunately, Dr. Birnbaum covered uh, this, um, but I wanted to show that, uh, for instance, at the cellular level, these are adipocytes, um, bisphenol A, which is one of our classic um, poster children for endocrine disruption, um, actually loves fat. And many of the EDCs love fat cells. Um, so if you take the central adipose, ad ad obesity, adipose, whatever you want to call it, but central fat, belly fat, you can see that the anti-inflammatory components are knocked down, whereas the inflammatory cytokines actually are increased. And again, diet, activity, genetics, environment all play a role in metabolic syndrome development, but here you have BPA as one of the um, associated um, components for increasing that risk of development. So zooming out from the cellular level, um, I wanna look at the organ level of endocrine disrupting exposure and how endocrine disrupting chemicals can affect, as we now know, estrogen, estrogen receptors, as well as androgens. Um, EDC exposure can affect the gut microbiome, which we're gonna talk about very briefly and cause what's called dysbiosis or an imbalance of good and bad bacteria. Um, of course, mitochondrial dysfunction, which are the organelles in uh, the cell. Um, but we also have disruption of circadian rhythms, which I think is really important when it comes to lifestyle um, and when we talk about sleep. So all of the, uh, so endocrine disruption can, con can uh, cause many organs to then increase their inflammatory markers. And this can result in metabolic disease as mentioned. Other things, um, I'm gonna, oh, so I wanna talk about inflammation. So. We talked about the cellular response, we talked about the organ response, and ultimately this can um, kind of culminate in this picture of inflammation, not just for comorbid conditions that are implicated in COVID, um, but we also have other long-term chronic conditions that we now have to focus on in terms of lifestyle, certainly Alzheimer's and its relationship to uh, inflammation, uh, neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's disease, um, certainly autoimmune disease, and even cancers. Again, endocrine system and immune system uh, work intricately for a whole host of chronic illnesses, but also cancer as well. Even endocrine or hormone sensitive um, cancers. Other things that contribute to inflammation, stress, poor sleep, um, even mental health conditions, um, certainly dietary exposures, drinking water contaminants, um, but also nutrient deficiencies that do not help to, you know, if we're deficient, we actually can't fight back to many of the chemicals we're exposed to, and certainly inactivity. So let's zoom out a little bit more. So this is now back to a, a pretty important slide that I'm gonna go into, which is the clinical course of COVID-19 infection. And I think most people haven't really seen this. This is in a lot of the uh, um, medical research uh, literature. So. Um, generally speaking, COVID-19 infection clinically, meaning what the doctors see uh, symptomatically, what, what people are experiencing is stage one, stage two, and stage three. Um, stage one is generally asymptomatic. Um, generally, people don't feel terribly sick or they feel a little sick, and some people don't even know they were exposed and, and um, find out later that they may have antibodies. Um, stage two, uh, we see is the non-severe symptomatic, um, but generally do not progress to stage three, which is considered severe, um, where we have really a strong inflammatory response um, and some, and what we'll call the cytokine storm. It's almost like the, uh, the horse leaving the stable. It's very hard to get the horse back into the stable. And that's where we're looking for last ditch life-saving measures and supportive care. 80% of patients really go through only stage one or stage two. So by stage two, most people clear infection. Uh, and that's generally because of the antibody response that's built up uh, for the adaptive immune system. Um, and that's their job is to neutralize um, virus. Um, stage three generally is about 15 to 20% of those infected will move on to stage three. And then there's a one to 2% uh, chance of death. Now, the reason I wanted to, you to see this is because this is the clinical uh, progression of COVID-19 Infection, uh, infection clinically, and then overlying it is the immune system changes. And I thought this was really well done. Um, and we can see that you have, and I wanna see if I can get my, uh, uh, here we go, here's my, my uh, pointer. So we have stage one, stage two, and stage three. 
uh, as you saw on the previous slide. But now you see the innate immune system works very early on. It doesn't really have any selectivity. Um, this is where the viral load is highest and it tends to be uh, go down over time. Here's where the viral response start and where you start to get IgM antibodies, which is from the adaptive immune system. Those are the T and, C, T and B cell response. And again, generally by the end of stage two, most people have neutralized the infection and cleared it using those antibodies. But for a very small proportion, 15 to 20%, their, their uh, inflammatory response is not linear, but kind of increases over time. And unfortunately, you see the stage three where there's all sorts of cytokine release, coagulopathies, which means people clot much more easily in the uh, hospitalized and ICU settings. Um, and it's just a really important to see how these correlate between the immune system and also the clinical response. Um, I think this slide is really also very important because it not only shows areas uh, for therapeutic intervention, meaning the, the drugs that are used uh, currently in my patients even that lower IL-6 levels, that lower IL-1 levels, the TNF inhibitor drugs, uh, these are like rheumatology bread and butter, um, but really also the last ditch effort um, treatments that are being used, such as high dose vitamin D and IV uh, vitamin C, which is used often in sepsis in the ICU, even before COVID. Um, so this is a really interesting way to look not only at the therapeutic options, uh, but also the timing of these therapeutic options and whether or not we should be thinking along the lines of using some of these therapeutics earlier, uh, maybe when there's just a few symptoms, uh, maybe stage two or maybe early stage one and Eureka, maybe we should be using some therapeutics even earlier in our lifestyle in terms of maintaining a nutrient balance and lifestyle um, changes uh, that directly affect inflammatory level so that we don't prime our system to have a worse response uh, because of our lifestyle when we are exposed to an infection such as um, coronavirus. I think it's really important to note that coronavirus doesn't kill us. It's the inflammatory reaction to the virus that kills us. And I think that's a really important distinction. Um, in terms of te therapies, as I mentioned a few, IL-6 and IL-1 inhibitors, but we also now have remdesivir, um, which could be very promising. It certainly uh, shortens the time uh, in the ICU and on ventilator, um, ventilators, but we have IgG uh, infusions. We have convalescent plasma, which is looking very promising. Um, and now just within two days, we have dexamethasone, which is cheap and available and doctors have been using that for years. Uh, that's part of the recovery trial that's out of the UK where they looked at 176 hospital systems and um, 2,000 patients, and we're testing out six different therapies to see which uh, would work, which would stick to the wall like spaghetti, right? But now dexamethasone has risen to the top as really being um, quite promising. So we'll see. We still need um, uh, you know, randomized trials uh, to, to take place. So I want to go now to prevention. Let's, let's switch gears again. Um, prevention of not just infection, because we know CDC has a whole list of ways to prevent getting the infection, but prevention of the severe inflammatory response to COVID infection. And that's distinctive because um, we need to work on those inflammatory um, issues that prime our system. So in this particular study, which is interesting, 7,000 patients were looked at. Um, and what was discovered is that, as we would expect, diabetes, um, having diabetes as a comorbidity did increase the need for medical care, um, as well as even increased risk for mortality and death. But what was also interesting is that the well-controlled blood glucose in patients who were infected did far better than those who were not well-controlled for their glucose. And so that gives us a real tangible goal in terms of patient care of how do we really help people uh, lower their glucose levels, um, maybe through diet, maybe through exercise, um, but this should be at least explored. When, it talk, when we talk about cigarette smoking, um, this is something that's very interesting. We know cigarettes are full of toxic chemicals, um, heavy metals, benzene, uh, formaldehyde, a whole host of uh, really bad guys. But what happens with smoking um, is that it also increases something very important called ACE2 or angiotensin converting enzyme in the human body. Um, this is all throughout the body, but particularly prevalent in the lungs, in the lung tissue. And we know smokers have increased amounts of ACE2, but also increased receptors that catch the 
uh, ACE2 in the body. Quitting smoking actually lowers ACE2 and the number of receptors. And the reason this is important to coronavirus is because we talked about those spikes that are on the virus. Well, the spike proteins, they actually attach to ACE2 receptors and to enter the cell of the lung. So if we can somehow figure out whether ACE2 reduction um, can lead to better outcomes, that's another really important um, area of research. Um, and so here's a good graphic to kind of show that it's very simplistically. Uh, another area I think which is going to be interesting to explore as we talked about androgens and the endocrine disruption community, um, we now know, um, or at least we're getting, we don't know anything essentially, but we were thinking about why do um, men end up in worse condition than women in the ICU in hospitalization settings. And one of the ideas has come out of the prostate cancer research groups. And the reason being is that um, these guys who and gals who are pretty familiar with ACE2, um, because what they found was that um, men uh, with their androgens and their male uh, hormones tend to have higher levels, at least in the prostate cancer population, of, of a uh, membrane-bound enzyme called Tempress2, uh, T-M-P-R-E-S-S-2. And the reason Tempress2 is interesting is because it's in the membrane, but it also helps to cleave the ACE2 receptor um, and have the virus enter the cell. Um, and interestingly enough, men who have prostate cancer who are on androgen deprivation therapy as part of their treatment to lower those androgens to reduce the cancer um, spread, they actually do better. They actually have lower res uh, uh, response to getting COVID, but also they've been found 25% less likely um, uh, to contract it, but also have better outcomes um, than others. Uh, interestingly enough, male pot pattern baldness is hyper-representative in the um, uh, hospitalization community uh, from Europe and the United States. And so the question is, uh, is dihydrotestosterone or DHT, which is a metabolite of testosterone, implicated in that, in that high uh, male uh, rate uh, greater than women? So let's talk about the gut, really important. Um, the gut is the largest immune system, um, immune organ, uh, immune system organ in the body. It's really critical, important uh, for human health. Um, it's about 20 to 24 feet of bowel with trillions of bacteria that have evolved anthropologically for millions of years um, and really do protect the human body in many ways, as long as there's diversity and there's certainly um, you know, they keep their, uh, their numbers. There's also a, a gut brain connection that is vital to mental health. Um, so what's important about this is that we can have disruption pretty much on a daily basis through lifestyle that can disrupt the uh, appropriate balance of bowel bacteria, um, which causes dysbiosis. This can happen through stress, which changes the pH of the gut um, and then doesn't allow certain bacteria to thrive. It could be uh, disrupted through chlorinated drinking water and contamination, certainly food chemicals, a variety of them, along with pesticides, which kill off bacteria, right? They kill off bacteria in the, in the crops, but thus they can also do that to our gut. Um, and certainly endocrine disrupting chemicals from food, but also the food packaging, such as BPA in canned foods. Um, phthalates and plastics. So um, it's a very hard thing for the uh, standard American diet plus the chemical exposure to really maintain um, a healthy gut microbiome, but that should be a goal and it is certainly possible. What about medications? Um, Dr. Birnbaum, you mentioned this. I was pleased to hear you say that. Um, medications are no free lunch. Uh, we certainly need them. We certainly uh, would be lost with many of them that are life-saving. But I think we need to think about medications. This particular study I thought was really well done in Nature and just recently, or 2018, um, shows that non-antibiotic drugs can actually reduce very beneficial bacteria. Um, and that's really important because what are we using to treat comorbid conditions in this country and around the world? We're using medications um, that can disrupt the gut microbiome. So we're almost adding fuel to, to the fire. Um, Another really important uh, piece of information to know about medications is that many of them also lead to nutrient deficiencies. Um, as an example, metformin, which is a very common diabetes medication, lowers B12 levels. Um, proton pump inhibitors for reflux can lower, um, have been found to lower magnesium. In fact, it's a recommendation to get magnesium levels regularly. Um, B12, calcium, vitamin D. 
um, and can lead to increased risk for osteoporotic fractures. Dr. Cohen, I yeah. have to jump in and interrupt. Um, we have to wrap this up quickly because um, we have Dr. Myers ready, ready to talk to. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt. You have so much great information. Can, can I do one or two more minutes and that's it? Yes. Okay, great. So anyway, med, uh, medications are really important and we want to think about that. Vitamin D, uh, we know that that's being used as a last ditch in the ICU, but why are we not thinking about this because of its 400 immune system related effects? We should be thinking about diet, supplements and nutrients. Lifestyle, punchline, plays a critical role in cellular and clinical response to COVID. We know this through diet. Uh, we know this through exercise and phase two conjugation, breaking down chemicals. We know sleep and poor sleep leads to increased risk for infection. Um, and certainly stress and sleep uh, affect the NLRP3 uh, inflammasome. Smoking, we know medications should be thoughtful uh, because of their risks as well as their benefits. Um, and we also want to think about supplement use. Again, supplements that are being now thrown last ditch effort, effort in uh, stage three of COVID infection, but really many of these, if not all of these, can be found through diet, nutrients, through really clean, healthy food. Um, I wanna leave with this statement, which someone can read later, but essentially the, the punchline of this slide from clinical immunology is really that lifestyle genetics and our exposures all play this intricate dance and will determine our fate when it comes to exposures such as COVID-19 and other potentially future pandemics. Um, so we really want to think about all the things that all of us can do, including education in high school and teaching young people, which is what I'm trying to do, all of these exposures to get healthy before they get sick. My last slide, just a funny picture of us all having breakfast this morning, um, but actually it's a joke. Um, I just want people to feel empowered to move forward to make some changes in their lives, anyone listening, but also um, our communities that we can reach out to. So uh, thanks for having me and, uh, and thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Cohen. Dr. Myers, when you're ready, feel free to pull up your slides. I know we're running behind here, but we're gonna go over um, and we wanna give Dr. Myers ample time to give his presentation as well. Take it away, Dr. Myers. Great, well, thank, thank everyone for being here today. Um, I, and, and particularly to Linda and Al, Al Ailey, because they did such a wonderful job at, at demonstrating why COVID-19 is having such terrible health effects and how it can be exacerbated by endocrine disrupting compounds. I'm going to take a different approach. I want to ask, so if we want to get rid of, if we want to get ahead of EDCs, what do we have to do? And I, I think that the last two presentations made it very clear, if I can get this to, to go. Um, you click on your screen, Dr. Myers, yeah, I, I um, know. and it will, with your mouse. There. There you go. So it's a dark and stormy night in endocrine disruption land. You learn that exposure to EDCs is, is ubiquitous. You learn, you learn that there are lots of them, hundreds if not thousands of EDCs. They can cause tiny, uh, very large effects, even at low doses. The effects can extend over multiple generations. The replacements can be as bad or worse than the originals. And as we've just heard, some of their effects heighten COVID-19 mortality risk. So that's pretty dire straits. But uh, none of us give up easily in, under conditions like this. Um, and I, I want to try and look to the future and how it might be brighter. And what I would recommend is we think about working on four fronts. We have opportunities to change individual and family behaviors to reduce exposures. We have opportunities to stop what I call societal stupids. We can bring 21st century science to regulatory toxicology. And we can use that same science to help design inherently safer materials. So let's look at each of those. Changing individual or family behavior. I could spend the entire day giving you individual recommendations. I'm, not, I'm gonna do that for three, three steps that we can take. Stop believing that if it's on a store shelf, it's safe. Number two, avoid thermal paper. And number three, particularly relevant in the time of COVID-19, find out what disinfectants are being used in your gym, your school, the daycare center, anywhere you might be, and especially in hospitals. 
So I could go on with this list a long ways, but instead I'm gonna go retail uh, and tell you about what, where I turn to when I need practical information. On the web, the first place I go is Che's own becausehealth.org. For example, there's a complete guide to non-toxic cleaning and disinfecting during the coronavirus um, pandemic. And it's available right now at Beyond at Because Health. Second, um, I always go to ewg.org. They've got fabulous resources. Not the, one of the most important one is the Shopper's Guide to Pesticides and Produce. And then there's the Silent Spring Institute. They've got an app, Detox Me, and it, it uh, gets really high marks. Secondly, what are the books we can turn to? Well, there's Sicker, Fatter, Poorer by Leo Trasande. There's Green Enough by Lea Segedi. And there's The Obesogen Effect by Bruce Blumberg. And I would be remiss not to mention Our Stolen Future. We had a whole chapter on protecting ourselves. And everything we recommended there is still true. Um, but there's so much more that's been added by the, uh, people over the last 20 years. There are forthcoming books. Ailey Cohen and Fred Bonsall have a new book called Non-Toxic coming out shortly. Um, and by the way, Ailey at her website, uh, which is um, the, health, the Smart Human, um, offers to come to your house and do a chemical inventory. I just mentioned that in passing. Um, Countdown, a huge book about sperm count declines is coming out in February by Shauna Swan and Stacey Colino. In those two books, in fact, non-toxic is all about practical things that you can do. Okay, so let's switch quickly to stop societal stupids. At the root of a lot of this is that companies are forced to maximize shareholder value so they can't take a long-term perspective. They wind up doing bad things. Uh, and a current example there is DuPont and all the trouble they've caused with PFAS and the effect on their shareholder value in the long run was terrible because they took short-term uh, cuts. Second sustainable stupid, let's, let's test chemical safety with lab animals, not babies. Right now, because so little is testing before it goes into the market, um, we, we in effect are testing babies. Don't put sewage sludge, toxic sewage sludge, on agricultural fields. It's full of endocrine disrupting compounds and it gets into the uh, produce that's being uh, grown there in, or this, the grass that cows are eating and it goes up the food chain. Third, stop releasing contaminated wastewater back into surface water. That happens when you're on a river system and the, the first town that has a sewage system on it cleans the stuff up, but only partially, not removing what are called micropollutants. And um, then it, it puts it back into the river and goes down to the next town's intake. There are currently two commercial uh, approaches to uh, fixing that problem. One's called activated carbon and the other is ozone. They're pretty expensive. There is a third technology that is currently standing up and full disclosure, I'm on the board of this chemical company. It's called Sudoc LLC. And it's developing a family of catalysts that Terry Collins over the last uh, 30 years has developed, incredibly powerful. We'll see what the market ultimately decides about those three choices. Um, bring 21st century science to regulatory toxicology. First, don't assume that high dose testing reveals all adverse effects. This is something I spent a lot of time on because every regulatory test done in the world assumes that that's true, but we know from a lot of work, including especially uh, what's called Clarity BPA, which Jerry was a leader of, um, we know that low dose effects occur, adverse effects occur, and they are not visible at high dose exposures. There'll be a paper on this released in about two weeks that does a comprehensive review of the Clarity BPA by the part of the science done by independent scientists. Second, don't test chemicals only one at a time. That's how it works. That's how EPA does it. That's how FDA does it. They all do it. But what, what does a physician ask you when they, when they assign you a new a pharmaceutical? They say, what else are you taking? Chemicals interact. We know that. 
and yet all regulatory testing is done one chemical at a time. Lastly, let's regulate chemicals by classes. Linda mentioned the problem of, of BPA and BPS and BPF and all the replacements that are all in the same family. By and large, as each one of those replacements has been looked at, uh, its toxicology is similar to BPA. Um, and so if, if we're trying to replace something with something in the same family, we can't assume that it's safe. Let's help chemists make money by designing safer materials. This is really key because this problem, again, that Linda mentioned of, uh, of um, regrettable substitutes happens because the replacements that are currently available are all, were all developed using the, the old bad tools of, that led to the bad stuff in the first place. We need to help chemists make money by, design, by helping them design safer materials. To do that, we have to use 21st century science to guide the synthesis. And we have to do it in a way that allows the new science that is always emerging. We don't know everything yet. We never will. We have to have a way of, of incorporating that new science into the design process. I actually worked with a team of about 30 endocrine disruption specialists and uh, green chemists for five years to develop a, a, an intellectual framework that would provide chemists with the ability to design safer materials. There's Terry Collins on the left, John Warner on the right, two world-class green chemists, and then there's Jerry Heindel right in the middle, stirring things up, as he always does. Here's the group. Um, I, th I can give you the paper. I it's flipped past it too, oh, here, too, too fast. Uh, there it is. Uh, it's, it was published in Green Chemistry in 2012. So here we are. It does look challenging in the, on the road ahead, but there are some bright spots. There are clearly some things we can do. We just have to, we have to get to it. We have to start working hard together to solve the problems that endocrine disruption has created and find solutions that work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Myers, and to all of our, our panelists, our speakers today. Um, we're going to head into our Q&A session real quickly, see if we can get some of these questions answered. Jerry, do you want to read the first one? Oh, Jerry, you're muted. Let me unmute you. First question is for Linda, and it says, how do you suggest we clinicians deliver the message of the association between increased morbidity and mortality and environmental chemical exposures, particularly endocrine disruptors. Seems like this is a critical time to have this conversation. So how do we go about that? It's not an easy, it's not an easy um, fix, but I think um, our medical establishment overall is does not pay much attention to any environmental um, effects other than lifestyle changes and maybe air pollution in general because um, I think usually the clinician is looking for obvious effects in an individual not for public health effects and in the environment many um, many of our endocrine disrupting chemicals it's very hard to measure and make that one-to-one -one association between the exposure that you're having and the specific environmental effect that can only really be done on a population basis. But I think that, you know, I think that we've been trying very hard for many years and we've had more success with a couple of uh, physician um, uh, groups such as the obstetricians and gynecologists and such as the pediatricians in their understanding that there are things in our environment like endocrine disruptors and like other environmental chemicals, which do impact not only our own health, but the health of our children and generations to come. Okay, thank you. So the next question could be Linda or, or, or Pete, I think you both kind of touched and maybe all three of you, that the biggest risk factors are people are color, obesity and metabolic syndrome. And one of the things that uh, matches all three of those is their poor diet and high use of processed food. 
So do you people, the scientists here, think that um, processed food consumption should be an endocrine disruptor? Well, I'll, I'll start with that. And the point is, is that we have many chemicals that are used in food processing and the packaging of the processed food, which do impact our hormonal systems. That, that's absolutely true. And uh, there are also many naturally occurring um, um, chemicals which can be in our food. But we do know that processing of food often involves artificial sweeteners or excesses of sugars, for example, lots of salt, all things which are not good for us um, overall, as well as we know, for example, that artificial sweeteners change our microbiome and that has a tremendous um, impact on our overall health. Okay, there, there's interest to know a little bit more about the uh, differences between men and, and women. Why, why is it that so many more men seem to get so much sicker than, than the women? Ailey, you kind of talked about that. Yeah, I kind of talked about that because I think it's an evolving topic. It's really fascinating, actually. And even reading about male, male pattern baldness being overrepresented amongst hospitalized males, I find that really fascinating. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think the story is over with this. And I think as we look back observationally and go through chart studies, um, we will likely get some more clues. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's very remarkable. I mean, no one would have expected that. Um, and so I can't really comment more than that other than the fact that there's this temperance um, molecule that's very intriguing. Um, and I think there's a lot more research going to be going on about that and, uh, and, how, and how androgen deprivation therapy is so shockingly um, you know, it, it, those taking and those not taking can actually really predispose them to infection. So, um, so the answer is, I think the jury's out, but, but it is something of, of note and, and many people are taking it on as research now. Okay, thanks. There may be another hypothesis. Mother Earth is taking revenge. <laughs> the next question has to do with these spray disinfectants. You see them on TV all the time. They spray whole airplanes and, and whole trains and stuff. Do we have any idea what they're using and to be sure that those aren't toxic? Does anybody know what's in those kind of things? It, it varies from spray to spray. Um, it, you can't look at it and tell. But um, one of the things you want to find out is whether or not quaternary ammonium compounds are components. They're, the short name for them is quats. They've been given a free pass for decades, but research by some EDC scientists have revealed within the last few years is that they actually can be quite dangerous. So if you see a, a quat listed in the, for example, the swipe that's in your gym, don't use it. And can I make mention, there's a difference between cleaning and disinfecting and I think we need to kind of uh, understand what parts of our lives, such as our home, needs to be disinfected and what needs to be cleaned. If your home is essentially uh, COVID free and everyone's been home and you really don't want to be using disinfectants, which actually kill off uh, viruses and bacteria, cleaning can be just as effective. It actually decreases the amount of viral bacterial load. And many of the cleaners are usually much safer with less endocrine disruption chemicals involved. So um, I think understanding what your purpose is for cleaning versus disinfecting and where these uh, chemicals should be used um, is also putting some thought into that exposure issue. Okay, I think there are a few more questions, but I think this is probably a good time to stop. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Jerry, and to all of our panelists or speakers today. We're approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on Che's website soon. And tomorrow you'll receive an email containing a link to the video. The next Che Alaska call will take place on June 24th and is titled Cancer Causing Chemicals in Everyday Products, Your Right to Know and Necessary Action to Prevent Harm. 
On June 30th, this is very relevant to what we were just talking about, Che will be hosting a webinar on safe green cleaning, sanitizing and disinfection in childcare facilities and schools during the COVID-19 pandemic. We also had a previous webinar uh, last month that was on cleaning and disinfecting in the home, which you can take a look at in our archives. To learn more into RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about our upcoming events or more, please sign up to receive a newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. Finally, if you had a question we didn't have a chance to answer, and there were many, during the Q&A portion of the webinar today, please submit, to, submit it to Jerry Heindel at the email listed on our final slide here by June 25th. And we will respond via email as best we can. With that, I would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Birnbaum, Dr. Cohen, and Dr. Myers for taking time to present today. And to you, Jerry, for your excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us. We're wishing all health and wellness. Have a great day.